like the eternal city that is Rome. Rising upwards like a heavenly choir. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this show, and welcome on John Soto Santi. I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. You did absolutely fine. Thank you. Yes. So, how how are you doing today? I'm doing well. You? Yeah. Yes, I'm doing well as well. We had a bit of technical difficulties getting the show started, but now that we're finally talking, I'm very excited to really dive into your book. I usually don't have a book to put behind me here, but I did get a copy of Mortal Adhesions. And so okay. this is a brand new book, came out last summer. When I first heard about it, I was really intrigued just by the conversion story. So a doctor converting to Catholicism. So tell us about the writing process. When did you get the idea to tell this story? Well, I guess I've thought about it for years. And when COVID came along, I had a lot of free time on my hands, actually. I had uh, cut back as far as the number of hours on the practice. So I had extra hours. And it was very difficult. I had written many scientific papers, but writing, I tried to write the book as an interesting novel on purpose. In other words, if I just write to devout Catholics, that's not what the church really needs to do today. The church needs to go out and find lukewarm Catholics that only come twice a year, and they need to find some of the nuns that don't have a religion or don't believe in religion. And, um, and I know that when I was in that state, if I picked up a book and there was all biblical citations in the book, it would turn me off. I wasn't ready to start reading the Bible at that point in time. And I think most scientists are that way. I could be wrong, but I just, uh, we're so into our scientific literature and we're, we've got always an, an incredible number of articles to read at any one point in time if you want to stay up. So you're not ready to just jump into Bible. If you're going to jump into the Bible, you would have done that maybe prior to entering professional school. So I wrote it as an interesting novel telling my story, but I combined it with Father Robert Spitzer's Four levels of happiness. I don't. Are you familiar, Michael, with those? Um, we I have level one. Off my head, but I'll yeah. name them off. Okay. Tell us. Since I didn't give you any any background information that I was going to mention, that I actually have Father Spitzer's book here somewhere up to the front here. Finding True Happiness is the name of that particular book. You also can go to his website, the Magis Institute. But level one happiness. A lot of people are in level one happiness. Level one happiness could be something like, when I pass Baskin Robbins ice cream store on a summer day, even though I'm lactose intolerant, I'm willing to um, go into the store and buy my favorite ice cream cone on a, on a sugar cone. And to me, it's a delight for 15 minutes. I almost hate to finish the cone. Obviously, it's over after 15 minutes. So that's a real short thing. Now, how about if you want a new car and you love the smell? So you go ahead and buy the new car and you love the smell. How long does the smell last? Oh, a couple Six months? Days. I don't know. Yeah, a couple. So probably. You know, and then you got to find something else. So you're always signing something else. And sometimes something else is in there. And it tends to last. It's very fleeting, right? Mm -hmm. So I, we all go through things with level one happiness. But level two happiness is a little better. Let's say in level two happiness, you work hard. Let's say a degree. So you get a good job. You feel pretty good about that. I went through four years of college and I found a really good job. So that's good. Let's say that you're an athlete, you love athletics and you love tennis. So you go through five, six, seven years of umpteen hours a week playing tennis and you're pretty darn good. You get in a tournament and you win the whole tournament. Well, you won the tournament, but somebody lost. So it's an ego comparative thing. How about you buy a nice house? You say, oh, I finally got a nice house. But you notice that there's no view and your neighbor has this great view. And and you really want his house. 
And then when you get that house, you find out somebody has an ocean view house. Now, where I live, there are ocean views, but in other places there are not. But there's always something you're comparing yourself to. But you feel good about yourself because you've you've studied hard, you've worked hard, you created something and you feel good about it. Yeah. Um, and that's where most people are. Probably if you took the entire American population, they bounce around levels one and two. And level three is a compassionate, empathetic stage where you volunteer to help people for no remuneration. And that's that's very good. And uh, I would say that many people, um, once they're there, they're quite happy. Uh, Father Spitzer talks about the transcendent level. I used to notice that once I became a Catholic, that in my office, some patients would come in just so bubbly and always pleasant, never gave my staff a hard time. And I often would kind of slowly find out if they had a religion or, you know, whether, whether they were devout Protestant or, or devout Catholic or whatever. And, and I found that most of the time it was true. They tended to be very joyful people. And, you know, I tend to think of happiness as great. And that's what everybody wants today. I don't know if you know that, but at Yale University, the biggest course in the history of Yale University, is, which is what, I don't know, 500 years old or something, uh, the 400 maybe, I don't know. It's, it's, it's an old university, I think it's the oldest in the country. And their course on happiness uh, had to go online or did go online during COVID. And over 4 million, I believe, have signed up for it. And all the Yale students pretty much have signed up for it. It's not being taught right now because the uh, the teacher uh, had to take a sabbatical. She just <laughs> wasn't too happy. I'm only kidding. I, I feel sorry for her, but she did take a sabbatical. Uh, a lot of stress, I think, going on with trying to do all she was doing. She's a good, really good lady. But um, happiness is an interesting topic and everybody wants it. And when they can't find it, some people try to find happiness with alcohol. Other people try to find happiness with drugs. Some of the drugs, particularly in Southern California, where I live, are laced with fentanyl. I'm sure it's, it's a countrywide thing. I read that 107,000 people, Americans, died last year from opioid, mostly laced with fentanyl, overdose. 107,000. How many died in the World Trade Center? I don't know the number, but it's under 5,000, maybe two, 3,000, which is terrible. Yeah. But every year, 107,000. I read an article that said, for once, the opioid death rate is not going up. It's held, holding around 107,000. It's not like it dropped down to 80,000 again. So, so we have a real problem in the country. That's why I wrote the book. Yeah. Uh, because I was, I was trying to find happiness the way everybody else tries to ha find happiness. I was trying to go uh, to trips around the world world, wherever I was sent by the University of Southern California to lecture. So my expenses were all paid for, but I bought a big house overlooking the ocean. I bought a brand new Mercedes Benz uh, S class, which is stretch type of uh, uh, automobile. I had everything that should have given me happiness. And yet I was suffering from severe stress, which was producing back pain and neck pain and headaches and insomnia. And I finally cried out to God and said, God, if you're up there, all I want is inner peace. And immediately, I missed mean, the first time I ever turned myself over to God. I think many in our country today think they are gods. They don't really, I mean, it's, you know, there's no uh, right or wrong anymore. There's no, it's like whatever I want, if it's not hurting anybody, it's absolutely fine. And we could go on with that topic all day, I think, and talk about some of the things that are going on in the country, but it's a real problem. So uh, I was finding that that wasn't the answer to happiness. My was married to a Catholic, very devout Catholic, but she, you know, let me do my own thing. And I tried everything. I tried being an agnostic, then I tried to be a new ager, then I tried Buddhism and transcendental meditation. And, you know, it, 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 nothing seemed to be working. And that's when I cried out to God. And what God gave me, you know, was, was ultimately very Catholic. Yeah. Ultimately, 
you know, I think you know, you probably know the end of my book and story about the uh, Camino de Santiago and yeah. the uh, special, uh, I'll call it miracle that, that happened to me on the Camino de Santiago. Yeah. I, um, since we're limited somewhat on time, I don't know if we should go right there. I think what I like to do is do a little more introduction of, of where I was. Yeah, for and sure. And then go right into, you know, what spurred me on. I I was um, very successful, but I wasn't happy. And I had a partner who I was a very good guy and a very good surgeon, but type A personality, just like my type A personality, and that didn't help very much. So Bruce and I had some difficulties. And to try to solve the difficulties, every quarter we would go off to Palm Springs, rent a nice big hotel suite, and sit around the table and work all day long on our problems and try to figure out what we were going to be doing. And um, I had a meeting coming up on Friday and I was going through one of these really stressful times and I had headaches and insomnia and all that stuff. And I was so stressed out, despair. And I didn't know what to do because up until that time, I could always figure out myself how to solve my own problems. And I thought I could solve my own problems. In a sense, I thought I was my own God. And obviously I wasn't. So I wasn't even sure there was a God. And so I looked up through my roof, my open roof of my car and, you know, on a home right near the ocean so I could hear the waves hitting the shore. And I said, oh, God, if you're up there, all I want is inner peace. Mm -hmm. Now, I did not hear a booming voice. Mm -hmm. And I said, please help me. And it was a submission, you know, that I, can, I am incapable of doing this myself. Please help. The very next day, I go to the local bookstore and I start looking at books on tape. And uh, now we, we stream everything, of course, but then it was a cassette tape or a DVD type, CD type yeah. thing. And I was gonna get a bestseller, but something struck my eyes and it was titled, Love is Letting Go of Fear. And I didn't even know what that meant, but underneath it, it said 12 Steps to Happiness. And I wasn't very happy. So I grabbed a hold of that tape, listened to it, and it was about two hours. And I felt so peaceful after it, after it went, it threw, it, it wasn't by any means, a, 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 well, yeah, it had Christian principles in it. It wasn't a particularly religious book, but there were many Christian principles in it. And it, and, and I became so much more peaceful. So I dropped the, the tape off that day or at my partner's office, because we, we were working out of, both of us owned two offices together. And uh, I dropped it where he was, the office he was working in. And I said, Bruce, if you can listen to this before you get to Palm Springs, I said, I, it was really helpful for me. And I didn't know if he would, but he did. And we had a meeting and it was the best meeting we ever had. It was just, we were just, everything was, you know, I can't say it lasted forever, but it was great. And a week later, remember I had said, all I want is inner peace, God. I used those absolute words. Bruce neighbor gave me a present and I never gave him a present. And Bruce shows up at my house a week later, rings the doorbell, and he's got a beautifully wrapped package in my in, in my in his hands. Gives it to me and says, "I've got this present for you." And I invited him in for a drink or a dinner or whatever. So I oh, know I gotta go. So I tear the thing open as soon as he left, and and there was his book. And I opened the book to see who the publisher was, and it was the Foundation for Inner Peace, mm -hmm. and it was full of tips on how to have more inner peace. Ultimately. You know, I spent some time on that book, and ultimately I went other places, the Catholic Church, of course, at, as the end point and the ultimate. But that led me to a whole bunch of things. The, uh, the man on the tape, he wrote a series of books of five or six or seven, all within a short period of time on so many different things. And I got, I bought all of his books and all of his tapes, and I would listen to him around the clock, hoping to be less stressed. And really I knew his voice started. well. Is continuing Pardon? a search almost really desperate to find that inner peace. Yeah. And and all of a sudden I'm at the the San Francisco airport to take my son to Stanford just to look to see if he wanted to apply. And I hear the same voice that I was hearing in my car. I said, Well, that's ridiculous. Why am I hearing a voice that I heard in my car? And I look up and there was a man around 60 years old talking on a wall phone back then. And his back was towards me. It turned out to be the author of the book that I really wanted to get to know. And I had a half hour on my hands and his driver didn't show up. He had a half hour, some, like someone orchestrated this thing. And, the, and we had this fantastic talk. He avoided me and he invited me to his, uh, 
his weekend retreat. And I went with my wife, my partner and partner's wife and the whole thing helped, helped me along. And so the years went by and I was doing better and I was trying different things, med meditation by Deepak Chopra and things like that. And much less stress, the back problems went away, but I wasn't really happy. And then a buddy of mine said, go on a Crescio weekend, which is a Catholic spiritual weekend in which the men go the first week. And if they're married, wives go the, next, the second week. So men's weekend, women's weekend. And you learn to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, given by the Catholic Church, in a sense. Uh, all, it's, it's a very Catholic expression. So I went on that, and the rector of the uh, things, his name was Mike, and he was wonderful. Big, strong football player type of guy, his Mike. And, and I, he said... We hope you'll be changed when you leave here. And I said, well, good luck. <laughs> In my mind, I said, good luck, you know, because I didn't really think anybody was going to change me. Well, I started to change. So that happened. And then um, something uh, unusual happened. One of the guys I shared with on the weekend sat at my, we break up at tables. And one of the guys that sat at my table, we became very good friends and we decided to have lunch three or four times a year. So I called him up and I said, John, are you going to uh, be able to have lunch with me coming up next week or two? Are your schedule really busy? Oh, no, my wife went to Spain. I said, she did. What'd she go to for? Or he said, oh, she's over there for six weeks. I said, is she taking a course? He said, no, she's walking the Camino de Santiago. Mm -hmm. And I said, what's that? He said, oh, that's a pilgrimage route, pilgrimage route across Spain to find the the cathedral where St. James Bones are buried. I said, well, that sounds good. But I couldn't understand it, why he would want his wife or let his wife or why she would want to do it, leave him for six weeks, be by herself walking at night trying to find a, a place to stay in it. So it didn't make any sense to me. So I bought a bunch of books on the Camino and I read them. And one of them told me about a little town in uh, Northeast Spain on the Camino called San Juan de Ortega, where there was a saint um, that uh, had helped Queen Isabella of Spain in the year roughly 1477. She sent Columbus in 1492. So in 1477, uh, she had not been able to have a son for seven years. She had one daughter, tried to have a son for seven years and couldn't have him. She heard about the saint and he lived in the 11, 1100s and early 1200s. And he was known for helping infertile women. And how that happened was somebody nominated him for sainthood. And they opened his casket in the early 1400s. And it, he had been in the casket since 1100s or 1200s and expecting a foul smell and deterioration. And there was a pleasant smell coming from the casket. And honeybees fell, flew out of the casket. Yeah. And... Honeybees are a symbol. Fertility, Pardon? fertility, I spoiled it. You're about to yeah, say. definitely, definitely. He became his fertility. And so he became known as a saint for, uh, for, for infertile women to pray to. So it's Queen Isabella had seven years without being able to get pregnant. She finally gets pregnant, not before she goes to see the saint. And she has a, she has a miscarriage. So now someone says, well, walk the Camino de Santiago and go see the saint and, and pray at his tomb. So she did. She immediately got pregnant and had a son and was so pleased she named the son Juan. And a year later, she went back and prayed again for a child. Didn't matter now. She had the son and she had a daughter and she named the daughter Juana. And so the, the saint, saint <laughs> Isabella, who's not a saint, some people think she should be the saint, a saint and maybe will be someday, um, had, had the two children. And she donated a lot of money to fix the church up even though only 12 residents now live in the town. There's a nice church there. But so when, when, when I, read the, I read the book that he was there, I had a buddy who was sick with, uh, oh, I know what happened. The, poor, the guy by the name of Mike, who was the leader of the Crescio weekend, he actually uh, came down with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in maybe his 60s, if he, if he, if he was even that old. And they didn't think it was going to survive. It was advanced. And I went to some healing masses for him to, to pray and, and everything else. But he also, because he had been on the Curcio weekend, uh, if anybody has gone to Curcio, they know that there's a lasting um, weekend, or not weekend process, but a lasting uh, process where you meet with other men who have been on a Curcio weekend once a week at a restaurant often and have breakfast. 
So I show up in the first week in January at the restaurant and sitting across from me is Mike, the big two, you know, husky guy, uh, six foot four, the guy that had been the rector at the Crisillo week. And he looks pale as could be. And he takes his hat off and he's bald. Well, two weeks earlier than that, my son calls me and he says, Dad, I have some bad news. My son, he's the only one married. I have three boys. And I have some bad news. Martha and I, you know, we've been trying to have a child now for a number of years. But Martha's had two miscarriages, the last one being not too long ago. And he said, we went to the doctor and he told us we'll probably never be out able to have a biological child and you know as an italian like italians like big families and i was extremely disappointed and now i knew about saint isabella and the saint and so in the back of my mind i said well she went there and had a baby you know i'd never get my daughter-in-law to go there but maybe i can go there and and, and so everybody else was thinking about going on this 500 mile pilgrimage, which had to be done either by walking or bicycling. I could not get off a six week period to walk across the community of Santiago, but I could get two weeks off to bicycle it. And we bicycled the 500 miles in about 10 days and 50 miles a day. But the question is, is now what happened at that breakfast? Mike's sitting across from me and he's so depressed and he's looking so ill. And I said, Mike, did you ever hear of the community of Santiago? And he said, yeah. And I said, let's do it. He said, you're crazy. I can't walk around the block. And you're going to ask me to ride a bicycle across Spain. Guy next to me was an ex-fighter pilot in Vietnam. Said, I'll do it. I'll do it. So the three of us, we talked the fourth guy into it. And the four of us went off to Spain in six months. But for six months, I trained Mike. I started at the coast where it was flat. And then we went up to hills. And we got to a point where we could do 50 miles in a day and climb hills. And we went there and everybody wanted to get to where St. James Bones were at the end of the trip. And I wanted to get there too, but I also wanted to get to the, the place where the, the honeybees had been earlier and St. Isabella had prayed. So I go down, I I didn't go into the tomb first, Mike went in there, I was starving. We had just ridden 25 miles in the morning and practically I'd practically been killed by a Mack truck. I had bruises all over my knees and everything else. And I'm eating my sandwich and Mike disappeared. And he comes back and he said, John, drop your sandwich. And I said, what do you mean drop my sandwich? Oh, I'm hungry. He said, drop your sandwich. I just went down to the church. He says, remember this is a guy with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He said, listen, before I started this pilgrimage last week or a couple of days ago, he said, I went to Lourdes and I bathed in the baths. He says, and it's incredibly holy there. It's one of the most holy places I've ever been. He said, but it's not as holy in the tomb of San Juan de Ortega. He said, I felt God was within there with me. He said, you go down there right away. And he sits down and eat his sandwich. And I had to run down to the church. So I go down to the church and he told me, go look for the steps into the basement. I go in the basement and I go in there and it's dark and dank and musty. And I'm on the upper level and I'm looking down at the tomb. And then my eyes finally could see because there were votive candles scattered around and my knees were not hurting. I had, they were, you know, bleeding basically from the accident and they, yeah. they weren't hurting. And I just started figuring, you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to pray. And I, I only knew a couple of prayers. I knew the Our Father and the Hail Mary and the Act of Contrition, um, but I didn't know any other prayers. And I just said them over and over again. And all of a sudden there was a big wooden cross on the far wall and superimposed, it had been there the whole time, and superimposed upon the wooden cross, which the saint may have made himself and put on the wall, superimposed was a um, small blazing cross perfectly centered over the wooden cross. And it was it was blazing, and, and but there was no sound or smoke. And it wasn't there for more than about two or three seconds. So there's one cross and it divided. And so all of a sudden, I'm looking at three blazing crosses. And then the outer ones divide. I'm looking at five blazing crosses. The yeah. outer ones divide. I'm looking at seven blazing crosses. And there are, you know, the, I didn't even know back then that the number seven is a very biblical number and that... Uh, uh, it appears in the Bible four or five hundred times or more. I can't tell you exactly, but it's in there a lot. And yeah. I prayed and prayed, and I was in a trance for a good 15 or 20 minutes. But I wouldn't give in. As a scientist, 
I wanted to know how those crop, how am I looking at these crosses? I honestly, the first thing I did was think that the Spaniards had set up a Disneyland type of animatronic show. Yeah. You've ever been to Disneyland? No, they don't even have the Pirates of the Caribbean. But uh, did you ever go in the Pirates of the Caribbean? Yeah. You go, all, that, you go around and, and the pirates start running all over the place and they're all controlled mechanical things. Yeah. I think that I tripped something when I came into the tomb and there was a light show on and they were, they were showing a video through onto the wall of blazing crosses. I was absolutely sure of it. So I looked around the back wall to see whether there were where the hole was cut out so they could have a projection through the wall onto the far wall. And it was a totally solid wall. Now it's like, and this is before you could have a LED screen embedded in the wall or do you know something really fancy. It had to be projected. And it wasn't. There was no hole there. So now I'm saying, well, where, where are these crosses coming from? They must be coming from a reflection of my glasses. Well, back then I only wore glasses occasionally to uh, to read. And so they were not even on my head. They were in my back pouch. And so I'm I'm thinking, where? And I'm still looking at them. They're just blazing, seven of them. And, you know, no alcohol, no sunstroke because it was cloudy all day. And and uh, it, it was it was a true vision. I mean, I I fought fought it for ten minutes trying to figure out you know the scientific rationale of, as to where this thing was. But anyway, all I can tell you is I finally gave in, and 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 from it changed my life. To, Martha became pregnant, which you know could have been coincidental or whatever. But when I was in that tomb, all of a sudden I got this feeling of fortitude and certainty. I mean, I knew she was going to get pregnant and have a baby very soon, nine months. And it's what happened. Tommy's now a senior at Yale University. And Mike, Mike, the guy that went on the trip and everything else with us, and his terrible cancer. Of course, he went to Lourdes, and then he prayed a little bit in the tomb, too. He's been totally free of cancer, and he's a deacon of the Catholic Church and has been for over 10 years. Yeah. So it was a fantastic trip. I mean, I, there's a whole bunch of stories in, in this book, and I know we don't have time to go through yeah. a whole bunch of them. I can tell you. My own self later on went to Lourdes to, to for a healing, and uh, an amazing couple of amazing things happened. And uh, I think we uh, can probably so. So why did I write the book? All I can say is is that I feel sorry for the people that try to get their joy from drugs and from addictions. And so you may say, why in the world did you write a book titled Mortal Adhesions? Do you know why? <laughs> I don't expect you to know why. Yeah, it comes from the Mortal. surgical field, doesn't it? Um, like the ad well, it, it uh, are from the surgical field. You're correct. Yeah. And we have to do surgery in areas of adhesions when patients have had previous surgeries. Mortal stands for what we are. We're mortal beings, aren't we? We're going to die. Mm -hmm. Do you know when you're going to die? Do I know when I'm going to die? Do we know when the Pope is going to die or Joe Biden or, or whoever else? We don't know when they're going to die. But you can look in the paper every day and young people are dying, right? Especially with the drug problem. A lot of people are dying in their 20s and 30s. So when you die, you better make, well, you better make the decision before you die. If there's no God and you just fall asleep for an ever and ever, well, you'll say you won if you have a chance, but you'll be dead and you're not going to know anything anyway. If there is a heaven, which you and I both believe, you're going to, you hope, and you hopefully go there and uh, you're going to be so pleased that you led the life that you, you have led. So mortal is what people concentrate on. I want to make my mortal self happy. I want all the accoutrements of happiness. I want, I want this and I want that and I want the best TV and I want the best car and I want the best house. I, I went to a, uh, a TED talk. I went to one. I heard it on TV. And the guy is going to talk on happiness. He says, I am, I'm really happy. I've made a decision. I'm going to bid, visit 20 countries in the next five years. And that's his uh, explanation of happiness. Of course, you know, there's, he's going to run into a guy that's been to 30 countries in, in, in four years and then he won't be so happy anymore. So, you, you know, you, as Father Spencer says, level four happiness is transcendent happiness. It's where you believe in God, you believe in heaven, you believe in the saints, and uh, anything one can do 
to move in that direction. I highly recommend it. Uh, and I wrote this book to read like a novel. So if you're not into uh, reading religious books, this may be somewhere to start. If you can find another one like it, uh, please, please do. But uh, Michael, how are we doing in time wise? Yeah, running a little bit out of time here. I did have one question. I think this ties in. Oh, you ought to be. I'd be yeah, happy to stay. And just uh, a 20 second answer. So you mentioned the 12 steps. And so that's where you were at before the 12 steps of happiness. Do you remember what the top step was there? What was the 12th step, the highest level of happiness? I can't give you the whole 12 steps because, uh, you know, it, it mean, like if you, but I can, I can tell you that what helped me, me, me a, a lot was uh, learning some sayings like, would you rather, be would you rather be happy or would you rather be right because how many times do we want to be right i mean i was actually you know going to these meetings with my partner and he wanted to be right and i wanted to be right how are you ever going to come to some middle grounds so and then and the other thing you do too, too is this fear and love you cannot have fear and love at the same time and so I like to think of line graphs. You've got this line graph going out. Here is fear and here is love. Do you operate out of fear? Do you have anxiety and fears about a lot of things? Or are you operating out of love? And so you want to you structure your life so that you're operating out of love. And 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 that's so really a lot of things, you know, forgiveness. Yeah, the transcendent values and forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah. You know, I forgot I couldn't you know give you all job. I could we maybe we should do another 30 minutes and, and yeah, do the other sure. <laughs> all the other parts of the story. Yeah, I wish I had to get out of here really quickly, but yeah, just a final encouragement, my final encouragement. Just go buy this book, Mortal Adhesion. So yes, it's a very good book. I read the end of it there and some of the beginnings, but I'm gonna good. say if you have a limited amount of time and all you want is if you're already a Catholic. You can just read the four last chapters and uh, get a lot out of them. Uh, a lot of the local priests in San Diego County have invited me to come and give talks to the parishioners. Well, they'll have like 100 parishioners show up in the evening. And I, I show the slides of the community of Santiago, including the tomb uh, that I was down in. I can't show the flaming crosses. But obviously, I was in a in a spiritual type of trance during that time. But the immediate, immediately, immediately upon my mind saying, we've got to ride to Burgos the rest of the day. That's another 25 miles away. I better go back to, to where they were having their sandwiches or they might leave me. As soon as I thought of that, if I had made this up through my mind, they would have all disappeared, but they didn't. They went seven, five, three, one, and then out exact same rhythm as they came in I mean, it, it was a, it was a godlike orchestration yeah so i could tell you all the other things that happened in between that god made this happen he put movie stars in front of me and nobel prize winners and i've got chapters about all of them so yeah so um, you can go to amazon to and read the reviews two. yeah part two Pardon? we might have to do a part two ourselves but it might have part two yeah we just saw the surface so yeah, thank you for coming on, John. Okay. Hello, Santi. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Everyone. I like what you're doing. Watching. For sure. Thank you. I appreciate it. So may thank God you. Go ahead, turn. bless everyone here. Not of the modern world. For, for the modern, 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 modern yes. world. That's yeah, right. Yeah, Fisher Baron. Hello. It's from the airport. Oh, yeah. How you doing? Hello. We're doing nice good. To nice yeah. to meet you. So who are you, sir? I'm Archbishop Joseph Nauman of the Archdiocese of Kansas City in Kansas. Yeah, do you want to bless this recorder? Is that is there a blessing for that? There's a blessing for everything. So, yeah, say, Lord, we ask you to bless this instrument and use it for good and for evangelization. Amen.